Hello and welcome to the audience in front of us as well as the audience at home. Thank you for being a part of Medfield TV's live election debate held at the Medfield High School Auditorium for the Bristol Norfolk District. Before we continue today, I'd like to thank some well-deserving individuals that allowed this evening to take place. We have a group of volunteers tonight that have been a wonderful addition to the planning process, setup, and functions of tonight's event. Cheryl Dudley, Eileen Disorder, Kelly Powell, Chris McHugh, Bonnie Ren Burgess, and a senior here at the Medfield High School, Caitlin Key. So happy to work with the wonderful staff here at the school, including our audio spe uh, specialist, Seth Hellerstein, the wonderful custodial staff here at the high school who helped us set up, and the event, uh, and of course the administration who allowed us to use this space. I have an amazing staff who's filming this event and a live selection meeting at the same time. So we uh, have, if you're watching on our government channel, you're watching the selective meeting on Comcast 22 and Verizon 45. If you're watching Rachel Perulo, who is at the selective meeting right now. On camera one, up top, he's covering the live stream for our viewers on YouTube, is Eric Giselle. We have Olivia Duvall, who's also a senior here at the high school. And we have Hong Lee Bruno on camera three. Introducing our wonderful people on stage with me tonight, we have three panelists from the Hometown Weekly, Amelia Torello. The chairman of the school committee and a member of the Medfield Coalition for Suicide Prevention, Anna May O'Shea Brook. And we have Carmen of the Medfield State Hospital Planning Committee, Gil Rogers. And of course, what would this night be without the candidates for tonight's debate? State Representative Denise Garland has joined us. She's off stage to my left. Uh, she'll be delivering a speech here tonight. Our two candidates that will be debating are incumbent Representative Sean Dooley. Brian Hamlin. Yeah. Here, we'll also have two Senate candidates, our incumbent Senator Paul Feeney and yeah. Senator yeah. Ventura. And finally, I'm the moderator for this evening, General, General Manager of Medfield TV, Brett Boreer. The formats and the rules of oh, thank you. The format and the rules of this debate are as follows. We ask the audience to remain silent throughout the debate, and we appreciate your cooperation with that request. Each candidate will receive two minutes to answer each question with a 30-second rebuttal to the candidate who answered first, with each, uh, which will be timed by one of our lovely volunteers. The candidate's order has been selected prior to the event tonight and will rotate through as the event goes on. Each candidate will have an intro and then follow that with questions from our panelists. From there, we'll have an intermission where we will collect questions from the live audience in front of us. After the audience selection, the candidates will each have a closing statement and we'll close out the section of the debate. We'll have an intermission for 10 minutes and we'll return for the Senate candidates who will repeat the process and close out the evening. Uh, our order tonight is incumbents first, and then our candidate will be second. So, without further ado, I have the pleasure of introducing our first part of this uh, debate tonight is our state representative for the 13th North Fork District, Denise Scarlett. Denise. my deep appreciation to all of Medfield for the honor and privilege of being one of your state representatives. And I want to express my gratitude to the voters of Precinct 1 and 2 for their strong support so that I could prevail in the primary and stand before you in the general election. As you may know, Medfield has two state representative positions. I represent Precinct 1 and 2. 
I am uncontested in the general election, but always responsible and accountable to you. I wanted to briefly give some examples of my work on the behalf of the people of Medfield and hope that you will see that this work is worthy of your attention and your vote. A state representative serves as a vital link between the town and the state. For Medfield, that link will be valuable as we move forward with the Medfield State Hospital Reuse Plan. Additionally, senior housing and housing for veterans and vulnerable populations is a major focus of conversation and energy and attention in the town of Medfield. And the ability to work with the state agencies and to be able to leverage resources will make a great deal of difference as we move forward navigating all the state laws, agencies, and resources that will be take place in this process. And also for Medfield, with great courage, has taken on the issue of mental health and suicide prevention. With my um, fellow representative and with the great leadership of Senator Paul Feeney, we were able to leverage $30,000 worth of money from the state budget to support our Medfield Suicide Prevention Coalition. It is the heart of the community taking on hard work and the strength of the state and the motivation of the community makes a major difference. There's also a strong link that happens from the representative to the state from, on behalf of the community and then on the behalf of the representative from the state back to the community. And for all of you, I hope you feel that it is my work as the chair of the Joint Committee on Mental Health, Substance Use, and Recovery. The 2018 opioid bill that you are hearing talked about pretty consistently in the press right now that deals with prevention at the community level um, in partnership with the synergy of the schools, deals with enhancing our behavioral health system. Behavioral health is mental health and substance use recovery together and deals with care and treatment and calls for treatment for individuals at the time they need it, in the place they need it, is the work of my committee. That work makes a major difference in our commonwealth for six million people, and it makes a major difference here at home in Medfield. The town of Medfield is strong with caring, committed individuals, serving and staff, elected, appointed, and volunteer positions, incredible individuals. It is my pleasure to work with each and every one I am proud of the town of Medfield, and I love the people of Medfield. I humbly ask for your vote and look forward to being of service in all of our endeavors together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Garlick, and now for state uh, debate. We begin with the opening statements from our two representative uh, candidates, and we have selected that candidate, uh, <laughs> our incumbent comes first. So, without further ado, uh, Representative Sean Dooley. Oh, uh, thank you very much, Mark, and, and thanks for everyone for being here. Um, I'd like to just take Denise's speech and put it instead of precincts one and two, three and four, um, <laughs> but that might be a little obvious. Um, it is my greatest honor serving the town of Metfield and serving all of the Ninth Millport District. Um, it, it really is, as Denise said, it's all about community. It's all about working together. It's all about you know, creating partnerships and relationships. And whether it's helping people here at home or helping them at, you know, navigate the process of government or working through legislative initiatives up on Beacon Hill, we all work together. And that's what makes Metfield such a special, special place. And we have a great community. We had a great turnout at town meeting last night. We have so much energy. You know, the state hospital uh, committee has you know met for I don't know 17 years now. Four, four, okay. <laughs> and it's been it's been such a great experience getting to know all of these people. And it is it is truly my honor to serve. And I hope I get to continue serving. Um, Denise and I work great together. We're, 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 we, we balance each other really well. Um, I'm not saying she has any strengths, but she, her, her strengths plays to, place to my weaknesses. And uh, it, it's, been, it's been wonderful. And so thank you very much for the opportunity. I hope I can earn your vote this uh, November or currently during uh, open voting, early voting season. 
And that's it. Thank you very much. Our next opening statement is from candidate Brian Hamlin. Good evening. My name is Brian Hamlin. Thank you for all coming tonight. I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. Brett, I appreciate your time and your staff's time out here tonight. <clears throat> As going forward here, I would like to humbly ask for your vote in regards for running a state representative. I want to make the community wholesome. I want to reach out. I want the community to be as good as they possibly can. I want them to reach out to their neighbors. I want to see some good come out of all of this. The towns themselves, Bedfield, one of them, is an outstanding town. I've been working here for years. I've met a lot of people here. People are always warm, always welcoming, and I want to appreciate that, appreciate that and spread that further. I don't want to see catastrophes having to happen when people have to reach out for it. The towns that are around us are always great. Medfield has been fantastic. They have great possibilities coming up with the Medfield State Hospital. The meeting last night went sensational. And they're just looking forward to a community that is overwhelming. When I went to community days and everything else, it's really staggering to walk around and see all the people around enjoying, having a great time, laughing, joking with each other. And that's something the rest of the world should be seeing. I want to appreciate that as much as possible. I want to be there for you on anything that I can do absolutely possible in the State House. I look forward to working with people. I've had conversations with Denise Garlick also, who's been an outstanding for you. Representative Dooley has done great work over here also. And I just want to appreciate the fact that I want to do more. I want to present that to you, and I want to humbly ask for your vote this fall, next week one week from today. Thank you. Now we're open to our panelist questions. Our first question coming from our media source, Amelia Torello, answered by Kennedy Hamlin. Hi, so my question for you guys is, uh, what role do you see the press as having in the electoral process? Kennedy Hamlin? <clears throat> Press will always have the information that's available for people. They need to get the explanations out there for them, the process that they need for having a good education on their voting. The press is going to be putting out the information for them that they're going to need to vote in one direction or the other, to have the opinions from people that are out there, so they, I should say, so they can draw their own opinions with good information that's presented to them from the press. And same question to you, um, Senator uh, Representative Dooley. Senator, Representative, whatever. <laughs> um, Senator Feeding probably wouldn't appreciate that, but um, the, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, the fourth estate is critical to our democracy. We need a strong press. It's a check and balance on our government. It's our information length to our people. It's a way to express ideas and share our understanding. And it has been a vital portion of our nation from before we were before we were a nation. Getting out the word, having having information. You know, Benjamin Franklin and you know and Thomas Paine working working on the on the press, getting it out to the people so people could understand the issues, to understand what was going on, to cut through the baloney and the facts of all the politicians making all sorts of spin and and uh, innuendo. The press is there to give us the whole story, the big story. You can't do it in a 30-second soundbite. You can't do it in a two-minute debate. You can do it in a three-page long article uh, in, in Newsweek. And so that's what I feel is the press's greatest role is being that protectorate of our electorate, that protectorate of our nation, and keeping everyone honest. Thank you. Thank you. And your rebuttal, uh, Kennedy. Okay. Um, the, what I see in regards for everything being out there, as the press presents everything out to the public, it creates a more wholesome community in the essence that they are now communicating. Press will draw out their information. People will sit and go through it. And as you present it to another person, you're now bringing the communities together because now they're sitting down to discuss things as they should be, 
not argued out, just an open discussion for things. Fantastic. Our next question is from our local government official, Anna May O'Shea Brook, and answered first by Representative Dooley. Thank you. As you know, here in Medfield, one of our core values is education. So much so that the town passed two overrides last spring, supporting an operational override and a new school feasibility. We are very grateful for this support and do not want to take it for granted. But as you also know, Medfield does not have a commercial tax base. The state aid portion of Medfield's budget has not kept up with the increasing costs associated with the pro providing a world-class education, so the cost of education is becoming more of a burden on the residential taxpayer. I know that each of you support public education, but how does that support translate to helping Medfield alleviate some of this burden, and does it or can it increase the state aid for Medfield? And a second part to this is, do you ever see um, the recommendations of the Foundation Budget Review Panel ever being implemented to help communities like Medfield? I'll take the second part first. Um, the, the foundation budget review, um, we were able to pass in the House um, here at the end of, end of the session. It is, it is critical, to, and it really dovetails to your first part of your question. The funding formula that we created 25 years ago in the state is broken. It, it, we have needs and uh, issues that no one ever even anticipated 20 years ago. You know, the, the special ed funding is is through the roof, and, it, and, it, and it's critical, but it's, you know, and ev even the transportation with special ed or, 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 you know, within the communities has gotten so out of control that it's really, really hard. And so what we really need to do is the, the Foundation Budget Review it, Commission did a phenomenal job of basically tearing everything apart and let's start over at the beginning and let's look to see how we can, let's, let's start at square one and what we can do to make sure that all of our schools are funded correctly or proportionately and make sure that there's as much parity as possible. And we were able to pass it in the House. Part of it got passed in the Senate. And we weren't able to get it through on the Conference Commission a Committee. But I do feel that there's a strong, strong appetite. Um, we've been making progress. I've been on the Education commi uh, Committee a few years ago up there. Um, four years ago, five years ago, there was no shot of it happening. A lot of the communities that are going to lose a little bit um, in order to balance things out were very had their heels dug in. Um, and so I really feel that that is turned. People are looking more, as we talked about community, they've, they're looking more at the bigger picture. A ri you know, rising tide raises all boats. And they really feel that that's where we're going to be coming up. Um, real quick, I see my 30 seconds is, is almost up. But um, as far as working with a small, uh, with a school building authority and things along those lines, you know, that's something that we are critical, you know, it's critical for us to do with you. Work as a partnership with the school committee, with the superintendent, with the administration, with the select board, and to make sure that we're able to get as much state funding as possible on all different issues, you know, whether it's special ed funding, you know, you know making sure that we get fully funded circuit breaker, make sure that we're able to get uh, public transportation covered, all of these things. And one of the other things I've been trying to do is create a third level of uh, special ed funding because we do have some children in Medfield that are and that's dramatically high. So, <laughs> sorry, I know, I know. <laughs> I'm Irish, I can't talk. I can't talk. I was, I was waiting for <laughs> <Come on>. yeah. <laughs> we, We're going to get a hook next time. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, candidate Hamlin, your response. Could you repeat the question, please? Yes, sorry, it's very. Anyways, uh, as you know, here in Medfield, one of our core values is education. So much so that the town passed two overrides last spring, supporting an operational override and a new school feasibility. We are very grateful for this support and do not want to take it for granted. But as you also know, Medfield does not have a commercial tax base. The state aid portion of Medfield's budget has not kept up with the increasing cost costs associated with providing a world-class education. So the cost of education is becoming more of a burden on the residential taxpayer. I know that each of you support public education, but how does that support translate to helping Medfield alleviate some of this local burden, and does it or can it increase state aid for Medfield? And my second part is, do you ever see the recommendations of the Foundation, Foundation Budget Review Panel ever being implemented to help communities like Medfield. Okay. Thank you for repeating that. Um, one of the big things that you're asking is, will it, is the possibility for extra funding? 
it was one thing that I definitely want to fight for. Uh, the kids that are growing nowadays, their education is not the same as when we were growing up. It's changed drastically. We need to keep up to date with it, and we need to start finding more funding for it. The biggest thing for kids learning is you need more of a one-on-one -on -one type of thing, not to say, but we need to lower the classrooms, population in classrooms or attendance in classrooms to get the teachers on board with it. We need to find a good way to do it. <clears throat> I want to look into doing different things, whether they be fundraisers for the different schools and everything else to bring the fundings towards it from the communities themselves still, but not on a tax basis. So as the kids are in school, the parents are going to have more attention to it. They're going to want more behind it as their kids are going to the schools and it's going to be something that they're going to be looking to do. Parents are going to want to have do more things for their children that are in there. So I'd like to see that come out of the community. And your rebuttal, Representative Dooley. Well, I, I, sh I should have known I had my extra 30 seconds. Um, it, 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 it is a process. It, it is very difficult. You know, we had, it's very frustrating because we had $80,000 set aside in the supplemental budget uh, this last time. Governor Baker put it forward. We had worked with, um, a lot of the powers that be that we had it, it was very bipartisan, that that was going to uh, increase the uh, regional transportation funding as well as this, uh, uh, bring the uh, circuit breaker for last year's budget all the way up uh, to be whole. And unfortunately, it got cut off at the last minute. Um, that money, for some reason, got dumped into the um, rainy day fund. Um, we're still trying to find out why that happened, um, but it's very, very frustrating because our schools are overburdened. We have you know, these, we come up with these ideas and we force them on our schools and they have to pay for them and our taxpayers have to pay for them. The schools have to do these things that they don't have to have, they don't have money for and so they're having to cut something else in order to fund these unfunded mandates that politicians come up with, you know, out of the blue without money. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. And I mean, I'm sorry, it's kind of hard just to, could you, I don't know if, if going over there, I can't, I can't really see you right there. I don't know, can you, or maybe I'm just getting a little bit, my eyes are I, lousy. It, it, <laughs> I see it all. Okay, yeah, let me know, yeah. please. And our uh, panelist, uh, our local resident, Gil Rogers, has the next question with the first response coming from candidate Hamlin. Thank you. This is a little different question, but I think one that affects everyone here. I think that there's an imbalance between the infrastructure that's in this area, the highways, the water system, the sewer system, and the growth, the enormous growth that's taking place in housing. And um, I want your reaction to, first of all, do you agree with that hypothesis? And then secondly, what to do about it? Getting around Medfield in this area by car, which is the primary means of transportation, is becoming increasingly difficult and frustrating. Getting to 128, to 95, to Route 9 is becoming uh, a real problem in the morning and in the evening. I live on North Street, and I find in the morning, starting at, I don't know, 6.30 in the morning, up until after 9, it's just a stream of traffic that's going on. It's hard, hard to get out. And similarly, in the evening, there's, not, there's backups all the way from Wellesley into Medfield and, and beyond. So the infrastructure, in this case the transportation, the road system, is out of balance with what the growth is in this area. And I don't think it's only transportation. I think the same kind of thing is growing with respect to the water system, the water supply system, and the sewage uh, handling system in this area. So it's an imbalance between infrastructure and growth. And while I'd like you to, first of all, see if you sense that same hypothesis, that same problem, and if so, what are your suggestions? What can be done about it? Thank you. There is no question the population is growing. The streets are getting more crowded. If you live on North Street, you're lucky to get out of your driveway, I believe, in the morning. There's a few areas that are very tight. I drive through Medfield all the time. We do a lot of work through the area and everything else, so I sit in that traffic that you speak of. <clears throat> I mean, you need to work on the infrastructure in regards for the lighting systems and everything else. 
I know they were at the meeting last night, they voted down speed limits and that. Speed limits aren't gonna do a lot for it, but we definitely need, we need to keep our eye on water. We need to keep, keep our eye on the sewerage. And the streets are definitely something that need to be worked on. They are old, they are outdated. We need to keep things up to date with it. So it's an infrastructure that needs to be watched in all aspects for the safety reason and for the ease of everything. The flying cars are coming along, they're not coming quick enough. Um, it's something that has to be watched over all the time in regards for what's gonna be happening in the community because you need to place out more time for it. <clears throat> We need to keep an eye on things for the roads and keep an idea for it and set up a master plan for it to get things going, to open up areas that are congested. Definitely need to. Okay. Um, agree with you 100%. I mean, you, you don't have to uh, be a rocket scientist to realize that the watching the Truska trucks drive down Route 109 and uh, chew up the roads and and then also the side roads and whatever other roads that you can ha happen that there's a problem with congestion and that and and, the, and our roads are getting beat our bridges are getting destroyed and it's not just in Medfield it's across the Commonwealth we need to as a state not just as a region not just as a as a local community we need to as a state and also partnering with our federal government is to understand that we need to have the infrastructure in place to make sure that we can be a 21st century state a 21st century city because it all builds upon itself if all of a sudden amazon comes here we're going to be devastated because it's going to be that many more cars on the road we need to make sure whether it's creating a new federally state project like a Tennessee Valley Authority going back to the you know, uh, you know back back a little bit a little before my, my time but create these real infrastructures with long-term projects and long-term understandings and and instead of each individual town doing their own little thing and not being in conjunction with the next town over we need to be able to be partnered a little better and make sure that our, our roads and our water and our sewers all connect all right sorry. Thank you. <laughs> and your rebuttal. As you talk about the lack of commercial tax base in Medfield, what needs to be looked at is the larger companies that are bringing the people along for the traveling as they're doing on the roads and everything else. You need to start looking at the tax basis that needs to be spread out from those larger companies that are in there to be dispersed out throughout the communities. If they're residents out of the area, I mean, you need to be pulling money out of there. It needs to be something that needs to be looked at. There is no question. And our final question is from myself tonight. Uh, your position as a representative uh, covers much ground. It changes day by day. Um, it's all the time. Uh, we've covered so much ground here of education, whether it be traveling. Uh, it's all over the place. We have a state rep who just wrote a bill on suicide prevention so uh, or on opioid use. So y your ground is covered. It's wide and vast. November 6 comes. Either one of you is elected as our representative. What is the most important issue you see tackled uh, as, as your day one starts? And that's your first answer is Representative Dooley. First issue into the new session? Yep. Oh, okay. Um, I would say right now, probably our number one issue is health care. Um, currently, 30% uh, of Massachusetts population is on Mass Health. It, it constitutes now 40% of our budget. It is growing at a rate faster than inflation. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that we cannot keep up that pace. It's continuing to grow. It's grown $4, uh, $4 billion over the past seven years. We cannot keep, sustain that model. If we want to have roads and bridges and we want to have infrastructure and we want to have more funding for our schools, we have to look at our, at our health insurance and make sure that these controls are, these costs are under control and also look at different models and make sure that one, we're getting the best health insurance and health uh, coverage for our citizens, but also make sure that we're covering every single base and make sure that we are uh, people that are abusing the system and whether it's whether it be doctors or, or, or prescribers or you know, big you know mammoth companies. One minute, uh, big mammoth companies that are that are gouging us for for the uh, prescription costs. We need to be proactive and really, really put together a comprehensive bill that 
addresses this and at least stops the bleeding of the funding. We need to have great health insurance for all of our people, but we also need to make sure that we don't do it purely at the expense of every single thing else. We need to have roads, we need to have bridges, we need to have schools, we need to have a million things. And if we just kind of let it run along like it has been without addressing the problems, it's gonna to continue to get worse and it's going to eventually eat up our entire budget. And your response. <clears throat> the healthcare industry is definitely one we need to look at. I wanna look one step further and go into the mental health industry. It's something that we really need to focus more on in regards for substance abuse, suicide prevention, as well as um, violence. We have all kinds of issues that, I mean, you watch the news at night, I mean, it's just horrific to see the different things that are going on in the country, the way things, people are being treated, the way people are being talked to. Uh, it's just amazing to see things like that, that when you focus on things on a mental health industry, you need to start paying attention to more things in regards for what's making people work, what's making them tick, what's causing the issues that are out there. If you can change your life, alter your life to make it something better, would it be something where they don't have the same anger that they do nowadays? Is it frustration? What's causing that? We need to really look at that. And your rebuttal. Um, won't disagree with that, but what I guess I would just add is that all of these things that we look at, and, and Representative Garlic can, can attest to this, is they're all interconnected. All the bills that we have, they have some sort of reach or some unintended consequence or some positive consequence with other bills. And so we have to make sure that we have a wide range of understanding on a lot of different things. And, and I, I, I have, I'm very blessed. I have a lot of experts that I can reach out to and that's what I try to do. And I try to make sure that we have all these things you know, lined up so they continue to move forward. And you know, if I have to pick one, that's the one I'll pick, but I can also probably ramble off another 50. <laughs> Absolutely. So at this point, we want to thank our uh, uh, representatives for uh, answering these questions so far and our panelists for coming up to them. But this is where the crowd now gets to be involved. Uh, you have a red and a green uh, cue card with you, or at least I hope you have one. Uh, the red one, please write your representative question down. You just heard these two gentlemen debate. Uh, so write these down, and then our lovely assistants will come up and start collecting from you. And we will ch each choose one question from each. All right, so thank you everyone for submitting your questions. Uh, definitely a lot of really good ones. We selected three. Uh, each one of the can, uh, our panelists did. And so we open with our first question coming from Amelia Tarallo and answered first by candidate Hamlin. So my question is, access to mental health services, ooh, sorry about that, is significantly limited in this state. How do you address this issue? What was that question again? Access to mental health services are significantly limited in this state. How do you address this issue? It's something we're gonna to need to focus on in regards for <clears throat> seeking more help and getting more people out to speak with them in regards for, um, we need the people to be able to open up. We need to be able to get to the, in touch with the people to have the accessibility to get to them and then work with them on it. And Representative Dooley. It kind of dove, dovetailed to my last question on you know, number one priority in the budget is it's, it's the cost of health care. Um, Right now, we have a shortage of beds, whether it's for um, opiate recovery, whether it's for inpatient, whether it's for outpatient. All of those issues are being squeezed because of the lack of funding. We don't have the ability to create more space, create more beds. You know, I, one of the things that I've been trying to work with the sheriff about is we, you know, we have a whole prison in, in, in Norfolk that's completely vacant and it's state of the art, it has all these wonderful things. I'm like, why aren't we using this as an opiate treatment center? Why aren't we using this to address some mental health? Why aren't we using this to address other issues? Not as a prison, but as a community. We have the resources, we have this money, we are paying for the electricity, we have a brand new solar field there, we have all those sort of things. So we need to think outside of the box. 
in how we fund it, how we address it, where we go to make sure that these people are getting the help they deserve and they need. And one minute. And and we need to make sure that we're able to. I, I believe it's our duty as human beings to take care of those people that have, whether it's, whether it's an opiate addiction or whether it's a, a, you know, another mental health issue, we need to make sure that we take care of them. We owe it to ourselves. It's, it builds a better community. It builds a longer, more sustainable community. And it's just the right thing to do. I'm done. Fantastic, and your rebuttal. We have, there are a couple of locations. We also have the state hospital in Rentham that would be able to use over there. And the biggest crisis is coming from the healthcare industry. As they look at for the opiate crisis for alcohol, it's a very limited amount of time that they allow for them for their mental health. <clears throat> as they go through it all, they're looking at days as they're going through things. And now they say, okay, well, you're better now. Mental health industry is telling them that they're better now. You can now go back to your life. They're not ready for that. They need the time frame out there for renewing their life, for getting themselves back on track. And it's something that they need to focus on through the healthcare industry to say, yeah, you're right. They need more than this because they just keep coming back. If we don't address it properly, they just keep coming back. So they need more time frames spent in there, and the, the healthcare industry needs to pay attention to that. Our next question is from Anna May O'Shea Brook for the representatives answered first by candidate, uh, by Representative Dooley. Thank you. Hi. What are your thoughts on question three and protecting LGBTQ rights? Uh, question three, for those who don't know, that's the uh, transgender rights bill. Um, the, the opposition is framing it as a bathroom bill. Um, I was the actually lead Republican um, on the original bill, uh, so obviously I'm going to be supporting uh, question one. I'm going to be voting yes on question, I mean question, question three. And it's, it's just, again, this falls back into just the same as what we've been talking about all night. It's about community. It's about basic human understanding. It's about basic rights. The reason I fought for it and the reason I unfortunately got attacked um, by the, you know, the alt-right on it was because this isn't about some bizarre boogeyman that's going to come down and attack our children in the bathroom. This is about human beings and having, letting them live their lives, Let them, letting them live their lives as citizens, letting them enjoy the same freedoms that everybody else has. Listen, if there's someone that's bad and doing the wrong thing, I don't care whether they're transgender, gay, straight, purple, whatever. They should be taken care of, arrested, convicted, and everything like that. But the reality is that has never been the case in the transgender community. There has been very, very, very no proof far as that I know of. Um, no one was, none of the opposition was ever able to give any proof about any boogeyman scenario. And so the reality is, we should support everyone. I don't care what your sexual identity is. I don't care what your nationality is. I don't care what your race or religion or creed. We're too divided in this country. We need to stop worrying about being divided. We need to worry about being Medfield residents. We need to worry about being Massachusetts residents. We need to worry about being Americans. We need to worry about being humans and being members of the planet Earth. And your response? Question three has my full support. <clears throat> There's nothing worse in life to be told that you can't live life as you want to. So if they're able to live life freely, they should be able to do the way they're identifying themselves to use the facilities. It will make them feel more comfortable. They aren't looking to hurt anybody. They're just looking to feel at home, at peace with themselves. So they're able to live their life in a comfortable fashion. If they're always tense, trying to do different things, it's never good for them. So it's something that they need to do in order to live their life better, it should be allowed. In your rebuttal? And I, I guess I would just add to that is that I had an experience right before the vote, and we, we were in a local establishment, not a, you know, with my with my family, and you know, with my kids, and there was a a, a, a transgender woman there standing, you know, standing next to us, and we were talking to him, to her, sorry, um, and 
after you know, we went and sat down, I asked my kids, I'm like, where should she go to the bathroom? And my kids, you know, you know, we're like, well, that's, she, that's her time. Oh, that's her time. Well, yeah. I, well, she should definitely go in the women's bathroom, and yeah. I won't go on and on. Thirty seconds is really short. It's a, it's a time, right? <laughs> Our final audience question is brought to you by Gil Rogers, uh, and the first one answering is Kennedy Hamlin. This is a very obvious question. What's your vision for the Medfield State Hospital? in three minutes or less. <laughs> two. Three minutes or less. Two, we got two minutes. The meeting was longer than that last <laughs> night. The vision up there, I mean, to having the cultural arts up there is fantastic. It's something great. I mean, if you can put together a community up there for senior people, for people that are looking to relax and enjoy their time around there, it would be absolutely fantastic. I mean, that was something that they're looking for. The grounds around there are unbelievable. The buildings around there are unbelievable. If you can bring those up to date, people are comfortable living in there, it's going to be unbelievable. It would be great for the residents of Medfield and anybody else that has the opportunity to be there. Any response? It's, it's funny that Gil would bring that, that question up. I'm shocked. Um, the, uh, my, my very first meeting from, I'm going to screw up my time, but even before I, after I was elected, but before I was sworn in, was in Gil's living room discussing the Medfield State Hospital. So this has been going on for quite some time, and it's been, it's been a pleasure. And it's been great working with Denise to, to bring the hospital home to Medfield. It, it, it can be the showpiece for Medfield. You know, Jean Minow and the entire Cultural Council have done a phenomenal job. Their, their, their vision for the future up there is, is phenomenal. I've been working with the, with the town planner and the town selectmen on the RFI um, and bringing in additional um, uh, developers. And we can really, truly make this a special place. We can, you know, I, I met with Jay Ash a couple weeks ago about doing a, uh, you know, out along the Charles, the building all the way in the back, having that being an innovation lab and bring in, you know, make it a co-op situation where we can bring in small businesses to have them start as an incubator there and have that be funded by the state because um, they're, they're trying to do more things along those lines to help small businesses get up and running, especially technology and or medical devices, things like that. Um, having the cultural center in the in the middle will really anchor having some good solid retail that adds to the community not hurts the community and then being smart about the residential I mean we have to make sure that we are able to uh, whether it's 55 plus or um, whether it be affordable or not affordable you know I shouldn't say not affordable but less affordable more, more middle middle of the stream as opposed to going through the 40b model um, we need to be able to let people continue to live here we have you know with the sledding hill across the street and with all the facilities it could really make Medfield a centerpiece. I mean, it, it is, it is such a great potential with the agricultural on the side. It is, it, it, it can really be smart. It can really be beautiful. And I commend your committee for all the work that you've done, well thought out. You've addressed every single idea and then some. And I, th I think the overall final plan has been phenomenal, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. So thank you. I think that was perfect timing. I, and I didn't even get the waving. <laughs> <laughs> Your rebuttal. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like I said, it's a fantastic piece of property up there. I was up there years ago. My dad had a friend up th that worked up there, and he was at the workshops. We used to stop over there, and we'd be in there. If they still have anything like that, it would be great to keep something like that open. Any of the citizens around there that would be liking to work on things, whether it be craft things, anything like that, just to help things, just to draw people in around there a little bit. Selling things around there, if they're building things like that, working on some projects that around there would be great for them to do something on that idea. It would be a great asset for having up there. Fantastic. So thank you all that per, uh, participated in this portion of the debate by submitting questions. We truly appreciate your addition to this event. We now end this portion of tonight with our closing statements. Each candidate has three minutes. We begin with our closing statement from Representative Dooley. Um, I, once again, thanks, thank you everyone for coming out and, and thank, thank you Brad and the panel for giving up their yet another evening um, for public service. Public service is so important. We need more of it. I commend Brian for, for running. I commend all of you for being active. It is a passion, it is a need. We have too many people within our community that drive on our roads and use the water, but their only commitment to the town or the community or, or is to open the garage door, close the garage door, and the world goes away. 
some of my Republican brethren might tease me a little bit, but, but Hillary Clinton was spot on when it takes a village. We need to all be working together. Not Republicans, not Democrats, people. We need to be helping each other. We need to be coming together like they did on the State Hospital Project and every single community, every single interest had a voice. It was amazing. Didn't always agree. There was some, you know, contentious moments. But that's what makes government work. That's what makes things work up on Beacon Hill. Doesn't always work. But it's building relationships. It's building partnerships. It's understanding each other's needs. And most importantly, it's willing to compromise. No one has all the right answers. I certainly don't. Ask my wife. Um, we need to continue to develop more public service. We need to have civics taught more in the school. I've been pushing that since day one. We just got a civics bill released today, which I'm very excited about, um, that's going to the governor's desk, which will create more civics in our public schools. Um, not as much as I want, because it doesn't have the funding portion, but nevertheless, um, we cannot continue on the path of div divisiveness that we've had in our country as of late. We need to be all together. We need to be one. We need to help each other. We need to stay strong. And it's just all about love and basic human kindness. And public service is a huge portion of that. I love being a state rep. I love helping people. And I would truly appreciate your vote. Thank you. And Kenny. <clears throat> Public service is an honor. It's an honor to be here in front of you now. It's an honor to be here asking for a vote. It is something I don't ever want to lose sight of. Going through what we are here now, I've been around through different meetings and we're sitting there to discuss things. Part of the opiate crisis was one. And we're sitting in a group where there was six different affiliates around there from nursing care, from sober facilities, anything on that idea, and they're all sitting around there wondering what we can do to help each other, saying they can't work, one can't work with the other one, they're missing phone numbers. And another group said it was, well, we have the phone numbers. And as they sat there in that meeting, those five groups afterwards were exchanging numbers afterwards to make things better. Just a simple meeting, just a group meeting like we have here tonight. People are gonna sit around and discuss things. What's gonna make the community better? We need to know those questions so we can come up with the answers. People are more than capable of coming up with the answers. And to sit here in front of you, I am honored to be here. I look forward to work, being working with you. And I want to. It's something that I want to work for you. I own, it's funny, we have actually Representative Julie and I both belong to the Norfolk Lions, and one of the best sayings I've heard from there is, neither above you, nor below you, but with you. I'll hold that for the rest of my life. There isn't anybody that's better than us, anywhere along the line. There isn't anybody that's below us. We're all the same. We just need to reach out, ask for help if we need it, lend the help if we have it. That's what we want to do. We want our community a wholesome place for everybody to relax and enjoy. Thank you for your time. And thank you to these two amazing candidates who participated uh, tonight, both our current representative, Sean Dooley, and candidate Brian Hamlin. Let's give these guys a round of applause. Good job.